Lord, thank you so much uh, for this day. Thank you for prayer, Lord. Uh, I appreciate it at an even newer level the value of prayer this last week. Lord, thank you for the, the meetings that we had on Wednesday. Uh, and even the Wednesday morning where there's, there's much less people numerically, uh, there's no less power and no less answers. And Lord, we thank you so much for that. Thank you that we're able to meet again in person and hear each other pray face to face. We do remember those who are still joining in on Zoom as well, Lord. Thank you for the technology that we're able to improve hearing those pray in person. Uh, but Lord, we do long for a day when we can forget about all these restrictions and we can hug each other and we can enjoy fellowship with one another. Lord, as these restrictions are easing, help us to, to remain respectful and, mm. and obedient and with the, the rules in place. And Lord, for us to remember those who will still be shielding for longer, that the restrictions haven't eased for many people. Mm. And Lord, as we think about those who have had uh, procedures recently, think about Andrea and Wendy mm. and uh, Paul of Wendy Porter as well, Lord. Remind, well, we're reminded, I should say, Lord, that life is so precious and fragile. And you take care and you are intimately involved with your people. And Lord, we thank you for as we pray with Reuben, thank you for the church and praying in that moment. It could have been so much worse, Lord. We thank you that not being in too much pain and comfortable and Lord, all these different situations that we come up against, whether it's a physical struggle and illness or operation or whether it's a mental thing that we're battling with, Lord thank you that you're, you're there you're only a call away and for that Lord we, we do give you our thanks as we come before you today and as we're about to, to sing our mm -hmm. praise to Holy God, mm -hmm. help us to remember who we are singing to. Holy Spirit, please remind us deep within our soul the one who we will one day meet. Mm -hmm. Our Lord, our Savior, our Father. Accept our praise, Lord, because we come to you in Jesus' name. Stand and sing together. Holy Spirit, living breath of God. Yeah, that, so I'm just going to play it through first. Just there's a couple of people I know who probably won't know it, so um, just to get you familiar with the tune, and then yeah, we've got the words up ready, so you can have a look at the words that Sharon's playing as well.
us to hunger for the ways of God. That's one of the roles of the Holy Spirit. We're going to look a bit at the Holy Spirit this morning in uh, this section, the end of John chapter 14. And that's a beautiful thing, isn't it? We might feel that sometimes as a conviction, because whatever we're thinking or saying or doing is not in the ways of God. So that initial prompting that we feel from the Holy Spirit actually might not be something that we welcome, because it might be, oh, well, I don't want to do that. It's contrary to, to what I want to do and say and think. But actually, it's absolutely stunning, isn't it? That God, by His Spirit, is guiding us to speak and act and think in a way that lines up with how God thinks and speaks and acts. Let's uh, give Him praise for that now. Let's uh, pray again before Derek's going to read God's Word for us. Father, thank you for Jesus, and thank you for your Spirit that you so freely pour out upon your people. Lord, thank you that you refuse to let us stay in the state that we're in, and change us from within. Lord, please keep doing that. Please keep prompting us to live in a way that's pleasing to you, to to live in a way that's like you. What an incredible day it's going to be when we get to glory and we haven't got that battle within anymore. We don't feel conviction anymore because we don't want to think or act or do anything or say anything that's different to how we should. What a freedom that's going to be. What a release from this bondage that we're still in. Lord, help us to overcome the flesh and the world and the devil this week. Whatever temptations we've got, thank you that there will always be a way out. That you'll provide a, a doorway of escape. And we don't have to say yes to the devil. We have the ability to say no. And to overcome whatever challenges. And Lord, thank you that you don't put us through anything beyond what we can bear. That you'll be with us every step of the way. And Lord, we do pray for those who who don't have that battle because they don't have the Holy Spirit. We pray for those who, who believe that it's okay to live in a way that's completely different from your way. What a dangerous thing that is to live your whole life in a way that's not pleasing to the living God, who will engage life and continues to give life. Father, please pour out your spirit across this county. Mm-hmm. Convict in great numbers those who don't yet know you. Reveal Jesus, Holy Spirit, so that many can get on their knees and be thankful for the one who died for their sin and rose on the third day. Lord, we love you and we praise you this day. For your glory's sake, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Dad. John 14, 15 to 31. Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells in you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live. You also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. 
whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Well, we're going to look at uh, two points this morning. Firstly, the, the Holy Spirit hope, and then secondly, how we obey. So Jesus is continuing to comfort the disciples because they're still quite distressed and disturbed because he keeps talking about dying, keeps talking about leaving them. Uh, so you cast your mind back a few weeks ago, um, that's what they're wrestling with, that's what they're struggling with. Peter's gone quiet because Jesus has told him, actually, you're not going to do what you promised you were going to do, you're going to deny me. And Judas has betrayed, and so there's all this worry and panic within the disciples. They're really stressed out. And Jesus knows that. And that's why he's bringing them this, this comfort. And it's, it's so natural for us to struggle when somebody close to us leaves. It's a natural thing. We shouldn't feel guilty about that. Especially if it's, I think probably the worst is parents. And you're left as an orphan. And that's how the disciples feeling. Jesus was, he was like their father, he was like their brother, he was their closest friend. He was all those things to them. And they feel like they're being abandoned. And they're left with no one. I don't know if you've ever had that yourself, where you've had somebody in your life, and when they've gone, you thought, they're irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. There's no one. And other people will say, oh, that's okay, you this couple will, will help you, or this person will kind of be a new mentor, and they'll be that father figure, or that, that sister, and you just think, it's not going to be the same. I want them. And only them. Carl and I experienced this in the first couple of years of coming to faith. There's a couple who just kind of took us under their wing, and, and they probably felt like they didn't really do much for us. But they did. They counseled us. Their love, their prayers, but they knew that they were there for us. We could just pick up the phone, and they were there. We could pop round for a cup of tea and sit down and just tell them our sin and confess. And they didn't judge us. They didn't say, oh, you're supposed to be a Christian. How can you behave like that? They just calmly nodded their head and said, right, the first thing we're going to do is pray. And then they, they might give us some advice. They might not. They didn't know it. When they died, we felt like orphans, our spiritual parents had been taken. And there were other people, it's not the same. We felt it when, when Merv Neal, who many of you know, told the church that he was going to leave the church and go to India. And there were lots of people who were, oh, this is incredible. 
God's called him full time to India and he's an assistant pastor in the church. He's going to take over as pastor. Lovely guy, lovely pastor. No, don't want him to go. <laughs> Let me do the same. He's my pastor. He's my first pastor. He's my only pastor. I want him. Can't replace him with someone else. Only he will do. And that's how the disciples are feeling in this moment. But before Jesus continues with these words of comfort, talking about the, his replacement, he tells the disciples what he expects of them. And he speaks about obedience. You will keep my commandments. If you love me, if you are who you say you are, if you're a genuine follower of me, you will keep to what I tell you. You'll obey. You will obey. I think we have to remember whenever we speak about obedience that God doesn't give us commandments to obey to make us better theologians. Instruction from God is not to make us more knowledgeable. It's to make us better people. The Lord disciplines those he loves. He longs to make you more like Christ, more like how you were originally created to be. That's what he wants. And we can obey at a kind of superficial level, and we can, we can be religious, and we can do it all out of duty. We can do that. We can motivate ourselves to behave in that way. We may even view Christianity in that way, just a bunch of rules. Well, that is not the Christian faith. You might even think, well, if I obey these rules, then I'll get to heaven, then I'll get to glory. But that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches, so in Colossians 1.27, Christ in you is the hope of glory. That's your hope. That's your glory. That's your ticket to heaven, Christ in you. Jesus Christ in you. Our identity as a Christian is in Christ. When big things come, we're in him. We're hiding behind him. He's our shield. He's our front. He's the one who's gone ahead of us. He's already faced it. He knows what's coming. He's ready to deal with it. And when the big day comes, when we die, when we leave this earth, when we stand before a holy God, when we see the Father face to face, we will stand and boldly approach that throne of grace because we stand in Christ, hidden in Him. So we're okay. We're hidden in Christ. But also, as Colossians 1.27 teaches, as Jesus is teaching in John 14, Christ is in us by his spirit. And this forms part of the, the comfort for the disciples, but it also teaches them how they're going to be obedient, where the power is going to come from, where the motivation is going to come from. It's not something they have to muster up themselves. Jesus is going to leave them physically, but spiritually, he's actually going to be closer to them very soon than what he was when he was sat next to them at breakfast. It's going to be within. On the inside, not just next to, not just getting alongside, but inside. This is big. And just because Jesus is leaving the disciples physically doesn't mean that his love for them is wavering. It's quite the opposite. And Jesus isn't just preparing a place for them in heaven, he's preparing a place for God in them. Have a read of verse 16 and 17. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So that emptiness that the disciples are about to feel when Jesus leaves them and he dies on the cross and then he ascends after the third day he rises and then he reappears and then he ascends back to heaven, they're going to feel this, this empty space inside them, this void. 
Jesus says, I'm going to fill that void with my spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to fill that emptiness. And you're going to be full, full of God, full of the Spirit. A couple of things we need to just clarify before we talk any more about the Holy Spirit. I have heard many, many Christians over the years refer to the Holy Spirit as an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is as much God as Jesus and as much God as the Father. When we start talking about the Holy Spirit referring to as some sort of it or force or power, we sound no better than Jehovah's Witnesses. So that's what cults do. They, they take truth and they twist it, because that's what the devil does. So it sounds quite similar to the truth of the Trinity, but it's not. And this is a fundamental truth. This is not something that we can say, oh, okay, well, we don't know everything in the Bible, it's just a misinterpretation. No. This is a fundamental thing. The Trinity is non-negotiable. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, equal, three persons, one God, same essence. This is so, so important. It's not it. He's not a force, he's not a power that's nice to have now and again. He's God, he's holy, he's as holy as the Father and the Son. Fully God. And he lives inside Christians. This is unbelievable what Jesus is telling the disciples. One of my favourite verses about the Holy Spirit, I think it's only in the King James Version, in Job, that the Spirit garnished the heavens. <laughs> Garnish the heavens. The Holy Spirit has no lesser value or worth or power than Jesus or the Father. Where we misinterpret it is we even do it with Jesus, and we, we talk as if there's a hierarchy within the Trinity. We say Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So the best day will be when we see the Father. And yeah, it was quite good when people saw Jesus. And yeah, it's all right. I'm the Holy Spirit. I'm that. And it's so, like, this is escalating. Not the case. Not at all. Because that's our misinterpretation of, of glory. We think that because the Father is the sender, that, oh, Jesus is the sent one, so he's kind of under the Father. No. He's equal to the Father. Jesus was happy to be sent. The Father was happy to send him. The Holy Spirit is happy to be sent and to dwell inside you. One will, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So when we see that tension in Jesus when he's, he's in Gethsemane and he's like, oh, not my will, your will be done. That's not Jesus' will against the Father's will. That's his, his human will will, if you like, human nature and the, the divine, having that wrestle, because in his human nature, Jesus was able to be tempted, in his divine nature, he wasn't, nothing can tempt God, that's where the tension was within Christ, because he was fully man and he was fully God, but there was no tension, never has been any tension between Father, Son and Holy Spirit, ever. So the Holy Spirit is as much God as Jesus and the Father, and the Holy Spirit is going to come and live in the disciples. You cannot have a relationship with the Father unless you're connected to Jesus, unless you're in Christ. But you can't have a close walk with Christ unless you're connected to the Holy Spirit and you're in touch with the Holy Spirit. And we might hear lots of kind of Christian talk and religious language about being in touch with the Spirit or being receptive to the Spirit or open to the Spirit or filled with the Spirit. What would we mean by that? And I think what the way that the Bible presents it at least is that we have an awareness of God. We're receptive to Him. We're open to his leading. We're willing to be taught by God. We're not just 
tunnel vision, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And that's the end of it. We're open. Is it right what I'm going to do? So we're in prayer with God always, like what Paul was speaking about. Pray continuously all the time. It's that being in touch with God. Where do we get that guidance? We get it through the Holy Spirit. That thing I mentioned to you a few weeks ago about Ellie, when we, we had a chat at home before bedtime about God speaking. She said, oh no, he didn't speak to me audibly, not like you're speaking to me now. She didn't use the word audibly, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, he doesn't speak to me out loud, I think she said. But he puts things in my mind that I didn't know before. He reminds me of things that I've forgotten. That's the Holy Spirit. That's how he works. He doesn't have to zap you and drop you to your knees as you're walking along. He can work in a gentle, loving, beautiful way. Even in the midst of our struggles, especially in the midst of our struggles, many people say. That's what he does. The Holy Spirit even prays for us. In Romans 8, when we're struggling to get our words out, he knows what we're thinking. He knows what we want to say. And he presents those prayers before the Father in accordance with his will, because his will is the same as the Father's will. That's what he does. And the, the original words for the Holy Spirit are paraclete, and depending on what translation you've got in front of you, it might say uh, comforter, it might say advocate, it might say helper. It's quite a difficult word to translate, and it's literally someone who gets alongside. That's what it's described. It's someone who gets alongside you. So it's someone who, who stood, it was a word that was used with, with a friend who would support their friends when they were dragged into the courts. And they could be guilty, and they could, it could be lots of shame brought upon that person. And if you were willing to go with that friend to court and stand next to them, that shame was going to come upon you as well. But you were willing to get alongside them. Because you're a helper, you're a support, you're an advocate. You're all of those things. Counselor, probably not my, my favourite translation because it, it suggests that the Holy Spirit is just like some sort of advisor. He's more than that. He's actively assisting, he's not passive. If you think about Jesus after his baptism, what did the Holy Spirit do? Did he just come and give Jesus a little bit of gentle counsel? No, he drove him into the wilderness to face the devil. That's what the Holy Spirit did. It drove him. Not that it was against Jesus as well. He was willing to go and tackle the devil. Maybe not in his human nature, there might have been some tension there, but he went. Advocate is probably my favourite translation because it gives us a clearer description of the role of the Holy Spirit. And the interesting thing is, verse 16 says, Another advocate. Another one who's going to get alongside. Why does Jesus say that? Well, he's been their advocate, hasn't he? Jesus has been alongside the disciples and he's saying to them, you're going to get another. Another like me. Very like me. Romans 8.34 tells us about Jesus as an advocate. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. He's our advocate. But listen to what else Romans 8 says. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us. Same role, same word. He's our advocate. He does the same thing that Jesus does. So the Holy Spirit continues the work of Jesus, like we mentioned a few weeks ago. Acts chapter 1, Luke part 2. These are the things that Jesus began to do and to teach, Luke's Gospel, and through Acts through the church is what he continues to do and to teach through his Spirit. The Spirit and the Son have the same will, motive, agenda, plan. 
It's father's plan. And they love carrying it out. They're on the same page. Two persons, but one essence, one purpose. And this is a massive comfort to the disciples. Huge. Because they're being reassured that the Holy Spirit is very much like Jesus. It's almost as if he's the same. Jesus has already told us in John's Gospel that he is the way, the truth, and the life. I look at verse 17. The Spirit of truth. Without the Spirit of truth, we wouldn't have this Bible that we try to live our lives upon, that we hold so highly in the way that we live. Because 2 Peter 1, 21 says, Prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, through human, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's where the power come from. That's where the light come from. That's where truth came from. The Holy Spirit inspired these writers, gave them the words. Every word in our Bibles has come from God, come from the Holy Spirit. Reading your Bible without the Holy Spirit is like reading a book without the light on it. You might as well be reading it in a different language. It's a waste of time. But it's just like any other book. No power without the Holy Spirit. Not just the Holy Spirit inspiring the writers, but you need the Holy Spirit inside the reader. Otherwise, there's no power. You just read it with a blank face. You just, it's just words. And it's not to say that you should understand every passage that you read, no. But if I could give every single Christian one bit of advice, I have to give myself this advice every week. And the advice is this, read less of the Bible, but pray about it more. Don't pressure yourself to, I must read five chapters a day. I must read ten chapters a day. I must read my Bible every six months, right the way through, or every year, or whatever it is. Sometimes you're better off reading less and praying about what you read a lot more and having more awareness of God as you're reading. How many times do you read the Bible just go through the motions? And someone said to you, what, what was that about? No idea. Just read it. That's not engaging with God. That's not engaging with the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we just need to slow things down a little bit, take our time and not be religious, not say, I've read my Bible through 57 times. The Holy Spirit reveals the ways of God to us on the inside. That's what he does. So he, he lights up the way and the truth and the life. He lights up Jesus. He's the illuminator. You might think of him like that. And truth is Perfect correspondence with reality. That's, in essence, what truth is. And the truth that Jesus is telling the disciples is, I'm not going to abandon you. I will not abandon my people. It says in verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Or was he referring to? Is he referring to when he dies? and rises on the third day and then reappears, because when Jesus reappeared after the resurrection, he didn't appear to unbelievers. He only appeared to believers. So 1 Corinthians 15 says, For what I, passed, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the Twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. What a beautiful thing that Jesus did. Is that what he's referring to here? Or is he referring to the second coming, when he's going to come back? He's going to appear to them, they're going to be with him forever. Or is he referring to them him returning to them by means of the Holy Spirit. Probably all three. 
the important lesson that he's teaching his disciples is, I'm not going anywhere. Physically, I'm leaving. Spiritually, I'm not. I'm staying. I'm staying forever. I'm going to make my home in you. And I'm going to make a home for you. It's both. And part of that help that we get from the Holy Spirit is assurance. We need assurance, don't we? We shouldn't, but we, we do. We do. Because many religious people are very uncomfortable with the assurance that Christians have in our faith and where we go. I speak to many Catholic people. People of lots of different faiths and they will say, mm, can you be sure? Can you, how can you, that's arrogant, that is. That's, that's almost blasphemy to say, you're definitely going to heaven. That's, no, I'm not sure about that. And the devil jumps all over you when you get those thoughts in your head. Especially when you're unwell or when there's, there's a big problem going on in life. That's when the devil is all over you like a rash. Are you really a Christian? Are you sure? I'm not sure. I don't think you are. Can you really guarantee that you're going to heaven? Have you obeyed all the commandments that Jesus has given? If you haven't, I don't think you're going. Actually, I'm pretty sure you're not going. That's the voice of the devil. The Holy Spirit doesn't speak like that. He doesn't do that. In verse 19, Jesus says, Because I live, you also will live. Yet a little while the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. It's a bit like the, the son who represents the father we were speaking about a few weeks ago. He might have a ring on, a family ring, or, or a little emblem, but he's a representative of the father. He has the same rights and power and authority. We are representatives of God. We represent God in this community. Wherever we go, we represent him. And our seal, our pearl, our ring, or badge, is the Holy Spirit. He's the assurance that we have. Actually, do you know, I am a Christian. Because, yeah, I haven't messed up today. I haven't obeyed all the commands. I haven't lived how I should live. My will hasn't lined up with God's will. But do you know what? I love God. I love Him. And I want to honour Him. And I want to glorify Him. And I want to be better. I know I don't deserve to go to this home that Jesus is preparing for me. But He's told me He's preparing it for me. And I believe Him. You're a Christian. You're a follower of Jesus. You're going to heaven, not because of you, but because of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will remind you of that. He will remind you of the things that Jesus has taught. And he helps us. He brings that peace to us. A peace that was purchased with the death of Christ. And he loves to do that. He helps us to obey God as well. But the challenge is, and this is our, our second point, is how do we obey God without being a bunch of Pharisees? Because Jesus, he wasn't keen on the Pharisees, was he? he criticised them a lot. He didn't like religion. So that's our second one. How are we to obey? Well, verse 15 tells us love. Mm. Love is how we obey. If you love me, then you will keep my commands. Not, if you keep my commands, then I'll love you. Or if you keep my commands, then you, you will end up loving me. No, if, it's the other way around. If you love me, then you will keep my commands. So love is the, the motivating cause of mm -hmm. obedience. And then you get to verse 21, and obedience is the test of the love. But it has to be that way around. Love comes first. We've looked a lot at King David on Wednesdays. We go through the Psalms. And when you think of King David, I wonder if you think of the Bathsheba stuff first. Because we read a lot about David's sin, don't we? Especially in Samuel and 
and so much of it. We read about his disobedience. We, we, we read about the Bathsheba stuff and we think, well, women and sex seem to be David's greatest treasure. That's where his heart is. But the Psalms tell us so much more. Because this, consistently, despite his, his failings and his fears, he kept coming back to God. He cheated on him, but he kept returning. Why? Because he loved him. He genuinely loved God. He was a man for God's own heart. He loved him. But we looked at Psalm 18 the other day. It's one of my favourite starts to a psalm, because it's so simple. And it's so profound because he just says, I love you, O oh Lord. Everything else will flow out of that statement. Well, that's, he's just putting it all out there straight away. I love you. I love God. I wonder how many times we tell our family that. We're racking our brains and praying sometimes, you know the words to say, and how can I describe the gospel in a way that's not going to offend them, but, but not, or not scare them off, but still I want to keep the truth. And how many times have we just said, you know what, I actually love God more than anything or anyone else? I just, I just love him. Powerful, isn't it? Really powerful. And Jesus said in Matthew 6 that where, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. So think about Peter. So Peter does mess up. He does deny Jesus three times. And then when Jesus does die for Peter, and then he rises on the third day, and he reappears, and he, he says to, to the ladies who were first to turn up at the tomb, go and tell the disciples, and Peter singles him out. And then he meets with Peter, and what does he say? Well, you haven't obeyed me. You haven't obeyed my commands. No, the question, the most important question is, do you love me? That's his starting point. Do you love me? Because if Peter loves Jesus, he will be. He will try and keep his commands. He will live for him. He will serve him. He will follow him. But does he love him? Ask the question. Obedience will come out of love. But love can't come out of obedience. So if we love Jesus, then we will submit ourselves to his will and to his work. Whatever he's called us to, we will. And so our, our love for him is our, our motivation to serve him. Otherwise, we just serve God out of duty. We feel duty bound to do things. So we do things begrudgingly. So no loving it trying to motivate ourselves or we're trying to, to be someone in the church or be someone in the community and do it to prove that we're someone. We do it because maybe we think it gains favour with God. All that stuff is just self-righteousness. It's all the stuff that Jesus says is wrong. It's like, no, no, you, you need to rely on my righteousness that I'm covering you in. You need to love me and I'll give you everything you need. Everything you need to obey. Obedience is easy when we're in love. A wife who genuinely loves her husband will have no problem submitting to him. That's the true test. And so 
then the obedience that, that, that just flows out of that heart of love. You don't bail out when things get tricky. You're actually brought close, just like God does with us. And we know that Jesus loved the Father. We know that. He kept talking about it, didn't he? We also know it because he obeyed him. Everything that the Father asked of him, he did, and he was pleased to do it. And it all flowed out the love within the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God is love. And so if you find yourself struggling in sin at the moment, it doesn't matter what it is, and you've got people around you saying, just stop it, just obey God, that is not the answer not going to help. Or it might help for a little while, but then you just keep going back to that sin. You keep visiting it and no one's looking. The problem is God is looking. And what you really need to do to tackle that sin is not just stop it and obey. You need to recapture your first love. You need to fall in love with him again. You need to be reminded of the things that Jesus taught, the things that Jesus has done for you, and the Holy Spirit will do that. He will remind you of the things that I taught. That's what Jesus promised the disciples. You have to just sometimes just take stock and, and sit down quietly and remember what God has done and what he's doing. And he is preparing a place for you. But he's not going to leave you or abandon you. He's coming for you one day. He's going to come to you. He's coming to collect you, take you home. He's going to do that because he loves you. So the answer to obey him more is to love him more. And the greater our love, the, the easier obedience is. Calvin called the Holy Spirit the inward teacher. I like that. He's always teaching us. He's always reminding us the things of the Bible, the things that God has taught his people. And part of that reminder is God loves you. He loved you before he even created this world. He was thinking about you before he was thinking about the sky and the birds. He always loved you. And he always will. So I'll just finish with this picture um, I was thinking of last night. I was thinking about long distance relationships because I don't like it at the moment. Carl and I are only living a couple of miles apart, even though we see each other every day. It's, it's uncomfortable for us both. All the stupid building work's being done, and, and it's, it's not nice. We don't like it. We know there are people in far more difficult situations, so I don't want to blow it up out of proportion. But it's long distance relationships, especially if you, you, you can't see each other every day, are really hard. Uh, and you're reliant on, on means to connect you, like emails or phone calls, letters. But it's not the same, is it? It's not the same, but it's better than nothing. It's a means to connect you to that person, so you might be able to read their words, you might be able to see a picture of them. Well, we might think about that, this stage that we're in. So we can't see the Father. It's not face to face. We can't see Jesus. But we have a means of connection. That means is the Holy Spirit. But actually, we shouldn't think about it like that analogy. We shouldn't think about it as a lesser connection. But a connection that's always going to be. It's always going to be like that. We might not see the Father face to face every single day in glory. If there are days, I don't know. But we're always going to be connected by the Holy Spirit. He's, he's come inside of us in our soul. And he stays forever. So that connection that we've got with, with Jesus, that's, that's a forever connection. And one day, yes, we will see the Father's face. Yes, we will see those nail-pierced hands. We will. Have you believed because you have seen me, said Jesus? Blessed are those who have not seen me.
everyone. But Lord, please be gracious to us again this week. Fill us afresh. Remind us of everything that you've done, everything that you've taught us. Lord, please help us to be open, receptive, and obedient to your spirit. Increase our love. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.